I love Halloween. It's the best. It's my favorite holiday, which is why I'd like to start today's discussion by talking about Christmas. Who are you? <laughs> oh shit! It's Santa Claus. Kirk Cameron. <laughs> oh no, no. <laughs> Uh, that's so much worse. That would be um, terrible. So when I was in the fourth grade, the newspaper <laughs> – I'm, I'm going – yeah, no, for real. I'm talking about Christmas. Okay. No, no, um, I, I'm with you. It, I'm, I'm – yeah. The local newspaper, the Altoona Mirror, had a, a writing contest where it was it was like a writing prompt where it's like, tell us what Christmas means to you. And I was still – I was in the fourth grade, so I still had like hopes and dreams. What um, a time to be alive. Right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I, I wrote this, I guess it was a poem or prompt or whatever, sent it in and uh, wouldn't, you know, I actually won. You uh, won for a Christmas story? I won for it was the very first thing that I guess technically it was published. This feels unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how to feel about it, but go on. Listen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I guess the first thing I've had published was like a Christmas poem. Who'd have thunk it? Who'd have thunk it? So what I, with, with winning, there's a couple things. Like they printed it in the paper, which was sweet. I'm a published author for my fourth grade Christmas prompt. You got to ride in the Christmas parade with Santa Claus, which was, and this, this is the one and only time I'm happy about this, but it was a horse drawn sled, sleigh, sled, that's, whatever. Yeah. Okay. Uh, no, that speaks volumes coming from you. It, they were Clydesdales. Oh, so big motherfuckers. Yeah, but it's like giant horses. It's kind of weird. Cause it like, uh, like a regular size horse. Scary. A, a giant sized horse. It's almost like they don't give a shit anymore. Cause they're like beyond fear. Huh? Yeah. Anyway, uh, sure. I also okay. got uh, a blanket and most importantly, a $25 gift certificate to the mall, Ooh. which like as a fourth grader, I'm like, that is more money than God. Yeah. No, that, that is a like a pirate's treasure chest to a, for, to a fourth grader. <laughs> so what I did with that, I went to the mall and they had just installed a virtual reality roller coaster. The, oh, OK. No, I know the yeah. things you're talking about. Yeah. Um, what a time to be alive. Uh <laughs> You, like, got in, they strapped you in, you, you got a screen, it was very realistic, like, oh, I'm going down the roller coaster, and, like, and like the, the whole thing, thing like, would, like, shift right. and adjust and spray water at you and stuff. Um, well, I didn't get the water, but yeah, 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 it's, it's the same idea. Um, so I, I did that, and I, I loved roller, I still love roller coasters. Well, yeah, they're great. Um, but what I used to do when I was on a roller coaster versus now, <laughs> which is just go, uh, gr- <laughs> grip my teeth and, and smile real big for those who are listening, is laugh like a maniac. Right. Nice. Uh, yes. So I'm this fourth grader in this VR roller coaster in the middle of the mall, <laughs> laughing maniacally. And I'm like, in my head, I'm like, oh, it's soundproof, right? Like it's got to be because I'm a fourth grader and it's like I'm locked in there, and I'm laughing like a fucking maniac. And I get out and or like the thing like <laughs> opens up. <laughs> it Darth Vader's you yeah, out. Yeah. And <laughs> and everyone's just kind of like, <laughs> is he is he okay? And I'm like, oh. Stage fright. Everyone um, heard that. So, so inappropriate time to laugh, I suppose. Which is a uh, I don't know. I think that's an appropriate time to laugh. Fuck everyone who <laughs> reacted poorly there. As a child in a in a virtual roller coaster, it's a technological marvel and fun. Laughter. Interesting. Interesting. Uh, the reason I bring it up because I wanted to talk about specifically inappropriate times to laugh because it it is inappropriate laughter that brought us the movie that we'll be talking about today. I mean, that's largely true. Yeah. Um, yeah. Whew. When I was in college, undergrad, for theater, there were two people that you had to keep an eye out for if they're going to be in the audience, right? Okay. One was very good. One was not appropriate. <laughs> um, hmm. the, the one – so like if it, was a, if it was a comedy, you wanted Xandra. Oh, my God. No, I know exactly you, who you're talking yeah, about. Yeah. No, well, you you want Xandra in there for a comedy, but you yes. need to readjust your pause for the laugh curve because yes. she would laugh a full 10 seconds longer than everyone else in the auditorium. But, and then it would make them come back around to laugh at her yeah. laugh. It was great. It got everybody, like, super excited about the show. And, like, man, that part wasn't very funny, but, like, she made it funny. And she made it funny. Perfect. Yeah. No, she helped you sell it. Yeah. It was, yeah. It was, yeah. yeah. Z- Xandra was always great to have in the audience. And, and she was, you know, if it was a drama, she was fine, too. She was wouldn't like laugh inappropriately. Sure, sure. But there was one person that you couldn't have come to your drama shows, dramatic shows. And who who was, was that? That was Corey. That was I, don't Corey. Know, I don't know if you you met Corey. He was shop dude. I don't think I knew Corey. Um, no. Why was Corey inappropriate to have at a at a drama? So so Corey is like a sick son of a bitch in a good way, in the most loving way possible. He's like the kind of person that you sit down to watch like a trauma horror film, and he's like, oh, so good. Okay, cool. Um, but. 
you, you know, like everybody was required to see the shows or like he would, cause he was like friends with everybody. And you could see him just like holding it. Like he would sit like this. He's like, <laughs> like holding the laugh is like this person, this actor's dying on stage. And there's like a big dramatic monologue. And he's, like, <laughs> and he's just uh, trying his best right. not to burst in hysterical laughter. <laughs> so like, if it was my show, mm-hmm. I watched him from the back. <laughs> I'm watching you. <laughs> Don't Just you burning laugh. Burning a hole yeah. through him with your eyes. However, if I was in the audience and it was a show I didn't want to see, you sit beside him. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> inappropriate times to laugh. Uh, I don't laugh ever. So, like, that's never happened to me. You've, I've never heard you laugh I've once. Never, nope. No, you have no sense of humor. That's why you started this podcast. Mm. <laughs> Damn it. That was really gross. Yeah, it was, it was extra plastic, gross. Jack. Mm, I think because it had sticky hand in it. <laughs> Welcome to Derazzled, <laughs> the podcast that takes award-winning worst films and fixes them. I'm host, Jack Colbertson, and here to suffer alongside me, as always, is Joe Nealis. I'm that one. <laughs> All of the movies on Derazzled won Worst Picture at the Razzies the year that they were released. The Razzies, for those of you who don't know, are something of a reverse Oscars. They recognize the worst film of the year, except when they don't. Today we'll be discussing a film that probably, like, a whole bunch of people think was snubbed at the Razzies. Joe, who will we be shining a light on for today's special episode of Derazzled Snubbed Edition? So, we should say this was this was nominated for Worst Picture at the Razzies, but it did not win. It did, however, win at... We just discovered there was yes. another bad movie award show. It didn't actually have, like, its own, like presentation or anything but they did it year to year up until like 2006 called the stinkers and this did win the stinkers in 1991 we're talking specifically about uh dan Aykroyd's magnum opus nothing but trouble the one and only film he's ever directed joe what did you know about nothing but trouble (laughs) before this i the only thing i knew about nothing but trouble was that dan Dan Aykroyd, john candy chevy chase and demi moore were in it and that i it was Always sitting on the top of the five dollar bin of the DVDs at Walmart in in my yeah. hometown, and the time that I suggested to my mom that we buy it because Dan Aykroyd was in it, she right. said no. Oh no! <laughs> I just had this like this memory just came back to me like yesterday. Like uh-huh. I swear, I remember her saying like, "No, that looks really weird. I don't want to watch that." Meanwhile, my mom right. willfully bought a, a VHS copy of Ace Ventura Pet Detective 2 When Nature Calls for me. For me, uh, and, who, who was in second grade at the time. A woman of a discerning taste. Yes. Uh, all I knew about it before we watched it was that like a family member had a copy of it on DVD. It wasn't even like a hard shell case. It didn't have like – they didn't give it the decency of giving it like a hard shell. Oh, no. It was absolutely like going to be like a flimsy cardboard yeah. case. Yeah. Uh, Just one of those slip covers. Which actually this episode is timely. Because I want to say it's Scream Factory is releasing it for the first time. Yes. No, you're right. On it, Blu-ray. Yeah, at Shout Factory. Shout I think Factory. It yes. Is. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's finally getting a Blu-ray release, and I think it's going to have like some additional interviews with Dan Aykroyd yeah, and, and Chevy Chase. I can't believe they're actually getting Chevy Chase for a fucking interview. Which for this. you'll understand once we've gone through some of the factoids. Why that? Yeah. Why is that's ridiculous. Bonkers. Like, good lord. I mean, if you know anything about Chevy Chase in general, you probably already understand why, but still. Uh, So real quick, I'm just going to run off the cast, the main cast, so you know who we're dealing with. Because it's it's actually like, if I didn't know anything about this movie and I saw the cast, I'm like, oh, all right. Uh, So we have Chevy Chase playing Chris Thorne. We have Dan Aykroyd playing not only Judge Vulcanizer. Vulcanizer? Vulcanizer, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Alvin Vulcanizer. But also Bobo. Also Bobo. (laughs) Uh, You have John Candy playing Dennis, the police officer. And Eldana. Eldana. <laughs> you have Demi Moore playing Diane Lightson. You have Valerie Broomfield playing Ms. Perda. It's really difficult it's to say. It's a really strange name. I did never say it once no. in the entire damn movie, I don't think. Um, but she she's like the sheriff's deputy, yeah. basically. Uh, then you have Taylor Negron as Fausto... <clears throat> Squirinizu. It's a is, weird. It's a weird made up name that I think Dan. It's, it's a thing that Dan Aykroyd in the late eighties, early nineties would think is Brazilian. <laughs> and then you have as his sister, uh, Br- Bertilla Damas. I'm gonna say something like that. Yeah, uh, playing Ronaldo. Uh, and then Little Devil is Little played Devil. by uh, John Daviscus. De- 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 yeah, something like that. And then lastly. And str- str- most strange, uh, the digital underground plays 
the themselves. digital underground. The entire digital underground, including a, a young baby face Tupac Shakur, play themselves in this movie. It's wild. So like, let me this give movie's you a sorry. fucking trip. It's... I should say, so like I'm about to read a summary of the film for you, but we watched this. I've watched it twice now. Right. As you tend to do with these. And I liked it. And I'm not proud of that. No, honestly, I enjoyed it the first time through as well. It is definitively a bad movie. Like, oh, it is yeah. not a good movie, but God damn it if it wasn't fun. I, like, we've watched, you know, we watched Last Airbender, we watched Battlefield Earth, we watched uh, Wild World West, which was yeah, fun for which the which is part. fun, yeah. Um, but I, will still, I will still contend, on any other year, would not have won the Razzie. Correct, yeah, I agree. This was the most fun I've had watching a movie for this. I, I have to agree. <laughs> it, it, lack of a giant mechanical spider aside, oh, so man. much fun. If Dan Aykroyd had thought of it, however, he absolutely would have put it in the movie. And the crew absolutely would have built it for them. Yeah. Uh, all right, let me see if I can summarize this monstrosity. <clears throat> all right. We open on a gorgeous aerial shot of New York City at night, scored by Ray Charles's The Good Life. Like the following 15 minutes, this has next to nothing to do with the narrative. <laughs> it does, however, set a very misleading tone. We meet smarmy-ass rich douchebag Chevy Chase, who plays a slightly less douchey Chris Thorne, a financial publisher. On his way to a party in his penthouse, he meets recently single lawyer Diana Lightson, played by Demi Moore, hot off the success of 1990's Ghost. Mistake number one. <laughs> Mistake number two is asking a total stranger for a ride to... Uh, Atlantic City, I think, for reasons. Yeah, it was Atlantic City, yeah. It really doesn't matter. Chris agrees because boobs. More or less. Yeah. B-plot. Uh, B-plot Brazilian siblings Fausto and Ronaldo, Taylor Negron, and invite themselves along for, again, reasons. For more noble reasons, uh, possibly a picnic, Chris takes an exit onto the Jersey Turnpike. I mean, Centralia. I mean, Silent Hill? <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, I mean Vulcan, Vulcanvania. After shit-talking the working class, Chris fails to make a, a full stop at a stop sign, incurring the wrath of the local law. A car chase ensues. Unfortunately for Chris, the cop car was designed by Pops Racer, complete with nitro injection <laughs> and fake road sign switch device. Uh, with the help of fellow officer Miss Perda, played by Valerie Broomfield, a sort of like proto Amy Poehler. Um, yeah, kind of. The gang is apprehended by Officer Dennis, a strangely straight-faced John Candy. Uh, they're taken through a Wonka wonderland of garbage to see the justice of the peace. Uh, wrangled into like a Kmart brand Scooby-Doo haunted mansion, the four stand trial before the 106-year-old Honorable Judge Alvin Volkenheiser, played to utter insanity by Dan Aykroyd. Seriously. There's no other way to describe it. That is <laughs> gleeful insanity. He's the human embodiment of like an idiom generator. Uh, yeah. It's like settings set permanently to like creepy old pervert. Uh <laughs> I describe him physically as a condensed wad of, like, stale pork rinds, <laughs> <laughs> depending on the scene, with a literal penis for a nose. Yeah. Uh, Diane, stuck between the egos of two men, tries to move things along smoothly. Chevy, unironically, yuppies things up, pissing off the judge. Judge trips a trapdoor, plunging the four into a pole of squeaky dog toys. Yes. I love it. Uh, we cut <laughs> to a Baldwin. Yeah. High on coke, impotent under his brother's shadow. Speeding through Vulcanvania, guns and ammo Amy Poehler and impossibly patient cop Candy arrest Baldwin and his drunk friends. The judge sentences them to Mr. Bone Stripper. Thanks to an overambitious film crew, the Baldwin gang is zipped away on a fully functional roller coaster into the gaping maw of Mr. Bone Stripper, a machine that even the Joker would think is kind of tacky. <laughs> Mr. Bo Mr. Bone Stripper strips them bones, poops them out the other end. Cut to dinner, where the judge serves yuppie-flavored mystery meat. One of... The inspirations for this movie was Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Yep. So I'm going to assume they're like, oh, those are people dogs. <clears throat> anyway, uh, the judge has taken special interest in Chris, a banker, blaming the entire occupation of bankers for the coal deal which drove the Vulcanizers to poverty. It's unclear. But an electric condiment choo-choo train brings Flavortown straight to your plate. And I love it. It's really good. What's the name of the song that it plays? It plays song. Yeah, it plays a song. I think it's Wabash Cannon or something like that. It, yeah, I, this gets bring, brought up like multiple times in a bunch of articles I read about about the about the movie. But yeah, it also plays a little song. Guess I'll have to watch it a third time. Uh, John Candy offers Demi more ants on the log, something that you assure me is quite yummy. Oh, they're delicious. Yeah, if you haven't had ants on the log, it's literally just a stalk of celery filled with peanut butter and then topped with raisins. For dessert, we see the first of two penis noses. <laughs> Finally, we meet Aldana, a mute John Candy in drag. Aldana immediately has eyes for Chevy. 
the train flings an hors d'oeuvre pickle at Fausto, a step too far for the Brazilian, who, with his sister, leaps through the closed window, landing in the junkyard. <laughs> I forgot they just jumped out the window. It's yeah. straight up like cowboy movie jumps straight out of the saloon window. They flee while Miss Perdue uh, fires at them with, I'm pretty sure it was an Uzi. I think it was an Uzi. They nearly make it even crossing a moat that smells like Sao Paulo. Mm. There's a couple of jokes about the stench of Sao Paulo that yeah. I don't think anyone actually got. I tried to Google it and like, is Sao Paulo is especially scented a certain way I don't know. stank apparently uh, apparently stank uh, garbage moat however officer john candy awaits them on the other side recognizing the plight of the working man they offer to take dennis and b plot on vacation <laughs> uh, after a brief escape attempt it's bedtime it's also time for the grossest most disturbing scene in the entire movie in a film with cannibalism dick noses giant shit babies and police corruption chevy chase kissing demi moore is by far the gaggiest it's awful it is not, it's, it, oh, it's one of the worst on-screen kisses that I think I've ever seen in my life. There's no reason for it to happen. It just, it just kind of happens, and it's just, like, it's where Chevy Chase's face just becomes a dead fish. <laughs> it's like a bloated watermelon with, like, patches of hair taped to it. And, like, Demi Moore's trying. She's trying her best. But, like, you, you can't work with that. Uh, anyway, it ends with Demi Moore shouting the title of the movie before passing out in bed. Yeah, she says the fr she says something about guys like Ugh. him being nothing but trouble, yeah. and then she just passes out apropos of nothing. I don't think anyone yeah. was drunk. Yeah. Like, and it's I, a weird scene. Also, like at that time, that was not the name of the the movie. No, it was. We'll it was get just, into that. Yeah, we'll get into that. Ooh, right. Here's it's a little <laughs> a little dodgy. Uh, so it ends with <laughs> her <laughs> falling into bed. Screen name and title. Um, when Chevy Chase attempts a Casey Affleck, Dennis reappears from B-plot just long enough to cockblock Chevy with the old twirly bed routine. Yep. The couple, couple, survive several sure. booby traps, first discovering the serial killer seven style treasure room full of driver's IDs and lice, uh, newspaper clippings, then are divided by a sliding board into the grotesque. Chevy lands in a ball pit of bones with a nearby peephole installed to satiate the judge's uh, exhibitionist kink through the hole we One watch yeah through the hole we watch the judge remove his penis nose revealing a vagina chasm beneath something i didn't see until the second time i watched it i mean it's just like the nose hole of his skull basically there are folds oh well, yeah because there's still like skin hang, kind of hanging down over it it's so. you know vagina folds that's what everyone's face looks like dude i don't know what to tell you <laughs> You got a vagina under there, too. No. <laughs> this is never addressed again, and it serves no purpose, and frankly, I'm sorry I brought it up. <laughs> uh, Demi somehow slides into a worse fate, landing in the scrapyard. Demi is quickly discovered by giant jello jiggler babies, Bobo and Little Devil, Ackroyd and Diviscus. They play cards with Diane? They play cards with Diane, cool. yeah. Chris is eventually spotted by the judge. A fight ensues before Chevy flees, running into Aldana, which sucks for him because whoever touches Aldana must marry her. Them's the house rules. Worst house rule ever. We'll get through it. Uh, before anyone can think about how awkward that role must be on any other day of the week, Digital Underground is arrested and brought on trial. And what I assumed was going to be it, like another Ninja Turtle rap corporate synergy kind of like awful fucking thing. <laughs> the Digital Underground, accompanied by Judge on Oregon, go past insane past poor taste and somehow circle back around on actually being pretty entertaining. That was a good scene. That was fun. <laughs> Following that scene, the digital underground then plays tie the knot with, uh, while Chris and Eldana are wed. Uh, this culminates into a far less painful kiss between John Candy and Chevy <laughs> Chase. The digital underground leaves before the old white man realizes that they're black while Chevy is sent to the bone stripper for yucking Eldana's yum. Yep. The bone stripper malfunctions, giving Chevy a chance to escape. The judge uses Demi as bait to get Chevy back. Chevy suddenly grows a back spine. Rambo kicks some explosives at the Vulcanizers, frees Demi from the greater team, which I love that name, and then jumps on a nearby train while uh, under gunfire. Which also Demi Moore has to make that same run and jump onto the train in heels. In heels. Which I think is the least believable part of this entire right. movie. No, not completely ruined my suspension of disbelief. There's no way she made that in heels. I, I can barely, like, run... I, I've played on train tracks. Hey, who hasn't? Yeah. The the shale is just like, it's, it, it does not hold. No, not at all. But if one person could, it'd be Demi. Uh, in a scene I can very much relate to, Demi and Chevy attempt to tell the police the plot of the film. The police agree to check it out, but they're cops and he's a judge. And suddenly 1991's Nothing But Trouble is politically relevant as the police <laughs> hand the victims over to the corrupt judge. Fuck. 
They sure did. I, I, I honestly, I didn't see that coming this time. I, yeah. I didn't think that they were going to pull something like that. But lo and behold, they, they cops, like, cops were cops that back then too. <laughs> they had like thirty police officers all like simultaneously like, "Hey, judge!" And I was like, "This is hilarious and terrifying and too true." Yes. Um, written to it, written into a corner, the coal fired Deus Ex Machina cracks the earth open swallowing the mansion and the vulcan hires hyzers into the flames below uh we briefly cut back to b plot where the siblings and dennis walk about their palatial abode located in rio de janeiro dennis has become their bodyguard ronaldo's 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 lover yes and escapes what was clearly aiding and abetting a family of cannibals just needs a big old handful of john candy's ass yeah. for a second there <laughs> she she really does just grab like a whole hunk jump. yep uh, not knowing how to end the film, we see Demi. <laughs> I hate this part so yeah, much. Yeah, it's bad. Uh, I kind of wish she just end, ended with that ass grab at this point, really. Uh, so not knowing how to end the film, we see Demi and Chevy back in New York City. They're like a couple now, apparently. One that definitely won't end the second Demi speaks with like a good therapist. <laughs> Chevy watches the news. It's then that we learn that the Vulcanizers have survived the destruction. Or at the very least, Judge Alvin has. Yeah, I guess we don't see the the babies. Yeah, we don't see the babies or Aldana, but we know we know that Alvin yeah. is alive. Uh, I like to think that Purdue. I'm gonna call her Purdue from now on. Sure, I'm just not sure. gonna do that to my mouth. Um, <laughs> but like she she dies a la Jurassic Park shit house. Oh, like, she does. She's That's like right. on yeah. the outhouse shitter, and the earth opens up, and she just plunks right in. Sure did. <laughs> anyway, uh, it's then that we learn the Vulcanizers have survived the destruction. The judge stating that he intends to move in with his grandson-in-law, i.e. Chevy Chase. We also get our second penis nose. The movie yeah. ends with the collapse of reality, physics rewritten, and a wet fart as Chevy Chase becomes a Looney Tune, dashing out of the room at such speeds that he leaves a Chevy Chase-shaped hole in the wall. The end. The end. That's it. It literally, it, he, it literally does go full Looney Tunes it's, to end, which is such a tone shift. <laughs> like, you would it, think, given the weirdness of the film, it would fit in, but... The physics that they, the the rules I, that they put in um, at the beginning, you're like, no, this wouldn't work. Yeah, there's nothing to suggest at any point in this film that that should be, that that should be feasible. And yeah. yet, Baldwin hot dogs, penis noses, not a problem. Um, I I fully I I will suspend my disbelief enough to believe that Daniel Baldwin was at some point a drug addled dealer that what? got thrown into a meat a meat grinder. I do like Chevy's delivery of that last line because it's uh, I think. It, <laughs> The judge is like, I'm going to go see my grandson and uh, or grandson-in-law in New York. And he's like, no, you won't. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, Poof, like the, the like. It doesn't skidding. play until after he's burst through the <laughs> wall, though. <laughs> right. like, yeah. like hole in the wall and then suddenly, no, you won't. <laughs> Which actually I think might be the only good delivery that Ch that Chevy has in the entire Real. film. It's. Um, oh. So that's the story of Nothing But Trouble. Now we come to the section called Explain Yourself. <laughs> I'm glad that this name is stuck for this section. Yeah. So what we were kind of alluding to with our cold open <laughs> is inappropriate laughter. That's kind of the genesis of this entire movie. Yeah. So a producer friend, didn't write down his first name, but like Weiss, Weiss? Weiss, yeah. Uh, Weiss had like fractured a rib. Robert Weiss, is that it, I think? That might, yeah, that sounds right. Um, he'd fractured a rib and he's like, hey, Dan and brother Peter, let's go watch a movie, but like... Bleh. No comedies. Yeah, it hurts when I laugh. Yeah. So, so they go and see Hellraiser. Right. Which I'm like, okay, horror movie, good choice. Not a comedy. No, not at all. But it was full of a bunch of Corys. <laughs> <laughs> the theater's just like chock-a-block full of Corys. And there's like, this is fucking hilarious. Yeah, there's a bunch of people laughing inappropriately. And it it's just, it shocks them into think, like, like to see people yeah. do that. So they're like, we should make a horror comedy together. Like, it's like we've we watched a lot of Hellraiser for a previous attempt at a podcast. We oh, we sure did. Uh, and at least the first two, I know <laughs> they're know not funny. No, no, like they're like Clive Barker went all out. Like yeah. they are, they are not comical in just about um, any way. Eighties man, what are you gonna do? Yeah, that's fair. Um, so, so there, there were there were some rumors that I had seen. I mean, th th some of this was from like the like the IMDb trivia page, mm -hmm. which were tried to say that like the the uh, the genesis of the movie came entirely from uh, a dream that Aykroyd had about John Candy in drag. <laughs> saw that. Which like that's that's not true. If you see that somewhere, that's not the that is not the genesis of this movie. It is no. this trip to see Hellraiser, and also for the actual story itself, the uh, yes. the, the fact that Dan Aykroyd once got pulled over in 1978. He was pulled over in upstate New York City 
taken to the Justice of the Peace to stand trial. He was fined $50, and after having paid it, the ju- the Justice of the Peace invited Dan back for some tea. And he was there for four hours. Yeah. So he was kind of like, I don't know if I... I think somebody just wanted to hang out with Dan Aykroyd. He, he referred to it as a kangaroo court. Which... Uh, which Probably is wasn't. great, uh, <laughs> but the um, the fact that the, the fact that that happened to him, just that he he got sucked into a, into that situation for four goddamn hours. <laughs> like, yeah, I would use that as as uh, as fodder for a story too. So Dan Dan Aykroyd did not want to direct this. No, not at all. Uh, he he had initially asked uh, John Hughes, and uh, John Hughes liked the story apparently, but only directs his own scripts, yeah. so, so he passed on uh, it. Director of Breakfast Club and Uncle Buck. Yes. Uh, he also tried to give it to John Landis, and John Landis hated it. That's uh, American uh, Werewolf in London and Blues Brothers and Animal House. Yeah. So, yeah, you'd think this has been right up his alley, yeah. but no. Uh, and Ivan Reitman, uh, unfortunately, uh, Ghostbusters fame. Ghostbusters stripes and Kindergarten Cop, which I didn't Wait, know. he did Kindergarten yeah, Cop? Apparently. I did not know that. Neat. Uh, yeah, he passed on it as well. So yeah. in order to prevent the deal from falling through, Aykroyd agreed to direct this himself, uh, which at that point, like, he was already planning to play the main, like, the male lead. Like, he was going to originally right. play Chris and Judge Valkenheiser. Oh, God. And then nobody stepped up to play Bobo. So he was like, well, I'm gu- I guess I'm going to be Bobo, too. Yeah. And he was a producer on the film. So, like... So the fact yeah. that like the studio the studio pushed Chevy Chase into the role like they like, and he only accepted it because he wanted to work with his buddy yeah and so that took something off of uh, off of Aykroyd's plate but even so that's a lot for one person to handle he, he tried to get anybody else to play Bobo he yeah. did not want to play that part not at all no even though it's like so stupidly in his wheelhouse to do something like that. I think it was not because the character is stupid. It is stupid. But it's like, stupid. The whole thing's stupid. I think specifically because he was already doing a lot of makeup with the judge. And then yeah, he had to, to do yeah, all to this do, makeup for the, the uh, Bobo. Absolutely. Yeah, to do two characters with that kind of intensive makeup, especially yeah. Bobo, that whole suit that's involved oh with being one of those weird mutant baby men. Have you ever Ugh. seen the behind the scenes stuff for like, uh, I think Evil Dead 2? No. It's great. Ted Raimi, brother of Sam Raimi, yeah. plays, I forget the name of the Deadite that's like the big, chunky witch. Oh! Um, she has a name, I can't remember. But he's in there. Oh, I um, didn't know that. And they, you see them, like there's behind the scenes stuff where like, they take off the head and the foot, and he's just like, bloop, like dumps up out the, sw- <laughs> the sweat. <laughs> Oh God! I, I assume conditions were probably a little better on this movie. I would imagine. Still, I have so much respect for anybody who pulls off acting in that kind of get up, like these proto Doug Joneses out there. Yeah. Just like, oh my God! Well, Doug Jones is pretty thin, right? Doug Jones is also like absurdly strong. To oh, me. Is he? Like, so there, there's a, this is a complete tangent, but like, to, like Doug Jones. Uh, I for, I think it was for the, on the the set of The Shape of Water. Okay. Um, got out of the suit for a stunt, and like a stuntman got in got mm-hmm. into the got into the get up to do it. One take, one take. This stuntman had to be helped out of it as quickly as possible so that he could go puke in a corner. Oh, really? Meanwhile, Doug Jones will walk around in those yeah. get ups all day, hours That's at a time. Okay. Yeah, he is abs- The constitution of that man is yeah, superhuman. I want to cast him in something. Right? He also just seems like a nice guy. He seems like a pretty yeah. nice guy. Anyway. Anyway. Yeah, so I, I feel, I feel, honestly, I feel for Dan Aykroyd throughout this whole, like, behind the scenes, like, explain yourself. Um, because he he and Chevy were buds, or are buds. I don't know how that shook out. Oh, God. But, I can't, I imagine that probably wasn't good for a while, but. So the the crew loved Aykroyd, right? Right, because he would green light everything that yeah. they wanted to do. They're like, we should put a roller coaster in. He's like, all right. Yeah, like the whole idea for Mr. Bone Split, most Bones, Bones, Bone Stripper. Bone Stripper. Yeah. I almost said Bone Splitter, but yeah. The, the whole idea for Mr. Bone Stripper was presented by the crew. The whole idea for yeah. the little condiment train was yeah. presented by the crew, and Dan Aykroyd kept saying yes. Yeah. So they're like, oh my God, we get to do such cool practical shit here. It's like, if there's a heart to the film, it's that, and yeah. I'll get to it. Keep, keep that in mind when I say... Uh, there was at one point like Chevy Chase freaked out on set. He was he was really shitty to most people. Like, he was shitty pretty to much Demi. everybody. He was shitty to Demi Moore. He was shitty as hell to Dan Aykroyd. He at one point was like, "I'm more important than you are on this set because I'm being paid more. Like, yeah, way more. 
Yeah, which is the studio's doing. Which that had studio's not, that doing. was not Aykroyd's choice. Um, I'm the... pretty sure he took a cut just to fund the film. But after that happened, somebody like a bunch of crew members come up and be like, "Hey, if you want to like drop a brick on his head, we'll do it." They were yeah, like the crew. Yeah. The crew was like, "We'll we'll yeah. we'll maim this guy for you, Dan. <laughs> we will name this like at the time a list yeah. actor." <laughs> for talking shit to you, Dan. You let's build a roller coaster. <laughs> <laughs> We've had more fun here than anywhere. Yeah. You're, you're our new dad. <laughs> so the movie went way over budget. It was like $5 million over budget, I think. Um, Which, given it had a budget of like $40 million, so... Yeah, total $40 million. It made $8.5 million. Yeesh. Yeah, it's pretty bad. A fifth. A fucking fifth. Uh, so, like, Warner Brothers tried to talk Dan. Like, Dan, please. Dan, please. Um, and the only reason he didn't get, like, just shut the fuck down is, and I've been waiting to hear you talk about oh this. Oh, my fucking God. Across the, like, one uh, one studio hangar to the next was a film called The the Bonfire of the Vanities. The Bonfire of the Vanities is a adaptation of a, of a 1987 Tom Wolfe novel of the same t- of the same name, directed by, by Brian De Palma, starring Tom Hanks, Melanie Griffith, Bruce Willis, and I forget who else. Uh, and it is a clusterfuck. There's an entire book about how crazy this production was called The Devil's Candy. That's a great which title. Which is specifically a thing that De Palma and one or two of the producers early on said about the kind of woman that they needed to play, like, bit extras that, oh, like, Tom okay. Hanks' character needs to be attracted to. That they that they need to be the devil's candy. That's the huh. I don't know where the hell they got that phrase from. The 1980s were whack, y'all. But anyway, so many things went wrong with this fucking movie from all the producers leaving and De Palma having to take those pro, those uh, those responsibilities on himself to being drastically over budget to not being able to find sets uh, to the reputation of the book as an indictment of 1980s New York's uh, New York's uh, society and culture. Oh, really? Preventing them from being able to get access to things that they needed hmm. to weird casting decisions that were changed multiple times throughout the course of the re- of the project oh, yeah. specifically having a character a judge character who was supposed to be played initially by I think Walter Matthau who then they said no to him because he asked for too much money uh who is then going to be played by Alan Alda who okay. asked for like a reasonable amount of money or maybe it was Alan Arkin I forget I always get those two also confused good. in my head yeah. either way regardless he got replaced by Morgan Freeman also good. Also good. Great. I love Morgan Freeman. It's just that it was a very weird choice for like a yeah, Jewish you go from like judge Walter character. Mathal to, to Morgan, Morgan Freeman. Freeman. <laughs> it's a weird shift. Uh, not to mention all of the animosity toward Bruce Willis on the course of this set. He was such a fucking asshole the entire time. <sighs> There is a scene that actually got cut from that film where where Tom Hanks is like trying to escort Morgan Freeman uh-huh. out of the um out of the courthouse and in the process like a s- statue had gotten smashed and a sword fell off of it so he's like literally fighting off the press with a sword and he like goes out of his way to hit Bruce Willis <laughs> extra hard <laughs> like you know if like Tom Hanks has taken his aggression down if, on you you probably fucked if up If Tom Hanks is frustrated as hell with yeah. you then like something's gone wrong In fact a second edition of this book came out in like really? uh, yeah like more recently okay. that specifically addresses Bruce Willis's response to the first version of the book He didn't like it Huh yeah, um, this movie was such a clusterfuck that Dan Aykroyd got away with murder on this fucking yeah, set. It's that's why astounding. we bring it up. Like that movie was such a cluster. Uh, Bonfire of the Van- Bonfire Vanities of the Vanities was such a clusterfuck that they're like, we know there's a fire behind us, but we got to deal with this one. It's worse. Yeah, <laughs> which the, is the, amazing. The only impact and like, like, those films continued to impact one another because the really? studio, this like the studio wanted this movie to be PG thirteen. Uh, really, nothing but trouble. They wanted it to be PG thirteen. Uh-huh. So when they saw the R-rated cut that was first done, they said, no, we can't do this. We're going to switch your release date with Bonfire. So Bonfire of the Vanities <sighs> came out in Christmas 1990. Uh-huh. I think this was supposed to come around, come out around like Christmas or Halloween 1990, mm-hmm. which yeah, you know, makes sense. Yeah. It ended up coming out Valentine's Day weekend, <laughs> 1991. Oh, my God. I cannot. I would love to have been alive at that time. I know. And like take a date like. Well, hey, honey, you like Dan Aykroyd? He's cute. Well, I should say uh, we were both alive during we that were, time. We I were just, I was just, we were five. Yeah, <laughs> so, well, I was, I was four, so well, no, sure, no dating sure. for me, but no, no smooch until five. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, I was a late bloomer. So, uh, yeah, a c- couple other little little facts. So, so Chevy was especially 
mean to Demi Moore. Yeah. But he would like regret being such a douche by the end of the day when he was back in his his room. He would call and like apologize to people in the middle of the fucking night. About like and say that his behavior is related to a bunch of personal stuff that was going yeah, on. It's like, dude, you're he... supposed to be a professional fucking actor. Like, what are you doing? Yeah, I, th- I I can't remember. Not that this matters, but like, I feel like I read somewhere that he was struggling with alcoholism. But that's probably don't accurate. Quote me on that. There's... Yeah, I mean, yeah, that could. Be, I mean, uh, allegedly, maybe. I don't know. Who yeah, who knows? Yeah. I think it's believable for the for the you know the the state of Hollywood at the time. Right. Yes. That's how that's tame compared yeah, to I was a like, lot of what was happening. I was I would have guessed like Coke or whatever. Right. Yeah. That was all, yeah, because you already touched on um, it being slated for originally for Halloween in 1990, and then Valentine's Day. Came they out said it was Valentine's Day weekend. It was cartoonishly violent. They said, yeah, that that was it was supposed to be go- like I don't know if gorier is the way to put it, but I think yeah. it, I think there were scenes that made it a lot more clear that those hot dogs were or, were Daniel Baldwin. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and there is a director's cut out there somewhere. Supposedly, yeah, um, I've, I know I've seen I've seen tell of it, but I don't I don't think we're ever going to see the. No, look. I don't think it's ever going to see. The I would day. I would love to see. Maybe, well, maybe if this Blu-ray cut. does well, um, Ackroyd will release it. Who knows? God, so. Well, that brings us to the end of Act One. Um, when we get back, we'll talk a little bit about the stats, uh, as well as what worked for us and what did not work for us for this film. Um, but yeah, we'll see you after some commercials. Welcome back to Drazzled. We're going to jump right into some stats. Oh, hell yeah. Um, There's some interesting ones for uh, for nothing but trouble. This is going to be good. Yeah. Uh, so in 1991, at the 12th Golden Razzie Awards. Yeah, it would be the 12th. Uh, nothing but trouble was nominated for six Golden Razzies. It won zero. It won zero? It won Zero. No, hold on. I thought it won one because there's a very there, there's a very specific statistic that I'm thinking of that Dan Aykroyd is one of two people to achieve. Okay. Well, uh, do we want to do want to check real quick? Um, I'm like 99 percent sure he won for worst supporting actor. Did he? Well, I have. Wor- he was nominated for worst actor as uh for for Volkenheiser and Bobo, but for worst actor, John Candy was nominated. I suppose they both they could have both been nominated. So the person who the the movie that did win was Hudson Hawk, which I've never seen. Um, which is the movie that Bruce Willis did after Bonfire of the Vanities. <laughs> yeah, no, Dan Aykroyd won worst supporting actor because he is one of two people to direct himself into a worst supporting actor win at the Razzies. Huh. The other being Gene Wilder. Really? Yeah. Well, what did Gene Wilder win for? I forget. Okay, but. Uh, so my mistake, Dan Aykroyd won for worst supporting actor, um, and he, God damn it, he earned that. <laughs> uh, he was also nominated for worst director, uh, worst screenplay, worst actor, Dan Aykroyd, and worst actress, Demi Moore. If I'm not, mis- um, if I'm not mistaken, sh- John Candy also got a uh, a nomination as worst supporting actress for Eldana. He, yeah, that that tracks. Yeah, that's the thing the Razzies do sometimes. Yep. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, well, uh, Demi Moore is nominated for two films, uh, The Butcher's Wife and Nothing But Trouble. Oh, I've yeah. never heard of The Butcher's Wife. I've heard of it. I've never seen it. And then, as you stated, it won Worst Award, or Worst Picture, at the Hastings Bad Cinema Society's 14th Stinkers Bad Movie Awards. Yes. And those no, and those uh, award show counts are correct. The Stinkers actually started before the Razzies, but stopped for mysterious reasons in two thousand after two thousand six. They like, just completely disappeared. Bring back the Stinkers. Uh, would you like to guess the critical Rotten Tomato score? Oh God, it's. I, I think I remember seeing this somewhere. Isn't it around like five percent? Thirteen. Oh, Thirteen. Okay, yeah. so it's gone up since yeah. the, whenever <laughs> yeah. whenever the uh, the thing came out that was. It, you know, it's interesting. I've seen for as bad as a lot of the initial reviews were for this mm-hmm. and like the reputation that this film has. There has been a big push in a lot of like think pieces and listicles to really? like, to like kind of not quite rehabilitate it, but like kind of 
hold it up as the bit of fun that it really is. Like, I think Collider had a, uh, suggesting that it's like a, a one amongst a handful of 90s movies uh-huh. or 90s comedies specifically that deserve a sequel, which oh I don't God. know how the fuck you would do that. But uh, but it's on a few people's like a few people's best comedies of the '90s lists, which is kind of wild. I enjoyed the movie, but I wouldn't say it's um it's up there. Yeah, I wouldn't say it's one of the best. It's damn fun. Like it yeah. is worth checking out. I mean, gross out baby man monsters and dick noses. So with that in mind, what would you guess the general Rotten Tomato score is? I'm gonna say that's probably closer to like a forty. Forty-seven. Oh, yeah, close. Yeah. Uh, and IMDb out of 10. That's a 5.1. That is a 5.1. I, I, I looked at yeah. that page a lot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, me too. Yeah, it's probably what I, I, I'd probably give it about that. I think Maybe it's reasonable. Like, it's not, yeah. again, it's not a good movie, but it is entertaining as hell. It's fun. I think it deserves a lot of praise for its practical effects. Yeah. If not for its acting. What worked? Casting wise. Uh, casting wise, you know, I did not dislike John Candy in any capacity in this no. film. I did specifically <laughs> the, note political correctness aside. Political correctness <laughs> aside, because like the, the him playing his own sister is a choice. Yeah, <laughs> let's I actually, say when we we go to the fix, I had some issues trying to fix it. We'll get to it. We'll get to that. Okay, uh, I have I have that to look forward to. Yeah, so that's that's fun. Uh, um, but as far as his performance go, like. He was actually he was, pretty charming, Eldana. Hey, I mean, uh, Jack. I mean, John Candy is a gen- genuinely charming guy. Yeah. At any point, anything he's in, I enjoy him in. Yeah, I've never seen a movie with him in it that I I didn't enjoy his performance. At least I saw like another thing that popped up in the IMDb like random nonsense trivia stuff that people post is that this uh this put a giant stop in the careers for a bunch of people. No, and it, it was didn't. like specific specifically saying che- like Chevy Chase never had a big hit movie after this, with the exception of maybe Vegas Vacation, um, and that. Dan Aykroyd never directed again, which, like, that's true. But then they tried yeah. to make the case that this hurt John Candy's career, and he had cool runnings, like, two years yeah, after he's that. Fine. He's he, he was fine. Demi Moore was fine. Demi Moore was fine. She's had a buckwild career. Yeah, right. <laughs> Just the only one I would say, like, okay, yeah, that was probably true, was uh, Dan Aykroyd never did do another, direct another movie. He never did direct another movie. And who knows if he was just like, you know what? No thanks. But that's the thing. I, I genuinely suspect that's because he never wanted to direct yeah. this one to begin with. Like, yeah. And unfortunately, the process of making this film did sour his relationship with Robert Weiss. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, that's a it's shame. A bummer. Yeah. The, like, even the smaller parts, I think, are cast pretty well. The, the, yeah. Um, I think over, overall, I think the casting's pretty good. Um, who's the, who, the, the, I, the doorman. The doorman the was door- like, that was a delightful little part. Yeah. I mean, and that's, and that's Pete Aykroyd. That's Dan Aykroyd's oh, brother. <laughs> yeah. Dan Aykroyd's dad's in there somewhere too. I'm not entirely sure where, but I thought that Fausto, Ronaldo were for, they don't make any sense in the movie, they but really like, they don't, but like they were fun. The yeah. actors clearly had a good time playing them and they, they gave those roles their all. I, I think I read that the two actors kind of like spent a lot of time getting t- to hang out and like make a bond so they, it they came across this. Yeah, no, it absolutely yeah. does. I think Dan Aykroyd is the judge works. I Perfect. Don't th- no, nobody else should have been Alvin no. Valkenheiser. You could argue that like Miss Purdue could have been somebody else, but like she was fine. I thought she, she I thought she did a good job. She, she yeah. does some Yosemite salmon. She, oh my God, she really did do some Yosemite salmon. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, she literally, when they jump up onto the train at the end, she starts like cursing like a, okay, no, that's the foreshadowing of the Looney Tunes bit right there because she goes full Yosemite oh, Sam as they escape. She was letting us know that's that the not, physics were slowly changing over to, okay. Yeah, no, right. oh, she casts a spell. That wasn't muttering, that was a spell. <laughs> no, it's not an excuse for the way that movie ends. <sighs> Story. What story, works for you for story? Um, well, I think some of the, like the finer points of like the backstory could maybe use a little fine mm-hmm. tuning. There's something I really enjoyed about like this small town of woebegone misfits yeah. and weirdos trying to make good on the uh, the short stick that they drew yeah. after this banking fiasco and this and this coal fire that they live over. Like, there's, I think there's there's something about that that I found genuinely interesting and like that might largely be just being from pittsburgh and knowing about centralia <laughs> for as yeah. long as i have, have. You ever been i've never been i know we i know plenty of people who have been show she's been um but i yeah like, i know i know tons of people who have been i have not gone myself yet yeah. though wow well, the road's gone it's gone now. oh yeah there's no chance of me going now yeah it's too i missed my shot but uh i did see it once but it was in the middle of like winter so there's oh shit pretty thick layer of snow 
So that would be creepy as hell. Yeah. No, it was definitely, like, creepy, but I was like, I want to see the graffiti, but... Yeah. Uh, I'll I'll take what I what I got. Here's why I enjoy this film. Mm-hmm. Once you get to Volgenvania, the pace speeds up super, so super fast. So much. Oh, my God. So you're not even... The, the story elements, the background, uh, they're whatever. You're kind of, like, washed over this bonkers, <laughs> gross story that you just kind of like ride with it, ride, yeah. ride with the weirdness. And if you enjoy that tone, it's kind of like toxic Avenger, right? So sure. like, there's a story there, but you're not there for the story. You're there for the weirdness. You're weir- there for the vibe. <laughs> and this, this leans into that super hard. Like the fact that it is a comedy that cites Texas chainsaw massacre <laughs> as one of its main influences. Yeah. It, Oh my God. Yeah. It, it doesn't give you a chance or it doesn't give you many chances, I should say, to like really kind of sit in the weirdness and think about it too right, long. Right. It just it is wave after wave. Yeah. And it just keeps you moving. Yeah. It's not I wouldn't say it's a relentless pace, like it's not overwhelming, no. but it keeps you going. Like it is it, it really it's uh it's a thrill ride. It's like even when a part doesn't work, Chevy Chase, you're <laughs> moving past that so quickly that you're like, eh, that's fine. Like even watching a second time, I was like, Man, I really do hate his performance. But I'm like, eh, I got the digital underground to look forward to oh yeah or i <laughs> <laughs> fucking got eldana like i didn't really get to cover her too much in the the outline because she doesn't really she's mute she doesn't say anything yeah um it's just john kennedy <laughs> yeah she... like, <laughs> that's that's only um th- this will become important <laughs> later but like john candy is so charming that it came through Despite not having any lines, yeah, no, he just—he's able to communicate with his like his gaze yeah. and his his just his body language really effectively as Aldana, yeah. I think. So it's, if you like read that character on a script, you'd be like, "Ew, gross, kind of mean, terrible." Yeah, um, it's like like a bad caricature of like somebody that the that the writer thinks of as ugly. Right, right, right. right. So uh, themes, production, hmm. what worked? Themes, given the story we have. <laughs> I think the set was perfect. The set was perfect. The production design is amazing in this film. When I was reading a little bit more about that, apparently this film has Mm -hmm. the same production designer as fucking Robocop and Total Recall. (laughs) Which, now that you say that, yeah, okay, yeah. yeah. It it actually actually makes some things make a little bit more sense in a way. It it does. Uh, Um, Which I love that so much. I love the original Robocop so much. It's, uh, It's not bad. Also, you said Total Recall? Yeah. I also enjoy Total Recall. I Same. wouldn't say it's good. No, but like, it, no again, it's very enjoyable. Not, not necessarily a good movie by any no. stretch of the imagination, but like it has its it has its cult status for a reason. A yeah. lot of that is the production design. Oh, uh, Philip K. Dave, what we've done to your stories. I know. Good Lord. <laughs> I forgot to mention this when we were talking about exp- Explain Yourself. So when the movie was finished and the studio was like, fine, it's done, they had the pr- premiere, right? Like they had the, the cast and crew premiere. Mm-hmm. And no one showed up from the cast no one showed up, like producer executives. None of them showed up. Really? But the crew showed up. Oh, I th- oh, okay. I think I heard about this, but I thought that the crew viewing was like a separate thing. I think yeah, it wasn't like, like I might the have Hollywood premiere. That, I think it was just like the, so this, the people so, who worked on it. Okay, yeah. So this is supposed to be the cast and crew premiere, and only the crew showed up. Yes, yeah. But they loved it. Yeah, they were like, "This is the proudest I've ever been of my work." I I so proud of my work. It's funny. I it was my favorite movie I ever worked on, and that that to me, because I think I'd read that even before we watched the movie, mm-hmm. painted the movie in a different way. Right? Yeah. There's I think that giving the crew that level of autonomy to like throw out ideas and have them yeah. stick. Yeah. And have them be included in the cut. Like it's their reaction was relatable. Like we, yeah, we've worked on some real <laughs> stupid short films that like. <laughs> Yeah, like our our viewings of them have been a blast. Not saying that they're bad; they're just fucking weird. They're they're for a certain demographic. I'll put it like that. Sure. Yeah, uh, I think that that's fair. Yeah, but like I've been the cast and crew viewings of our stuff where it's like, man, we fucking love this because we know like the work that went into it, into it, and we we got to, to like really be creative. The first time we watched Knife Breaker with everybody was oh just. <laughs> What I think is the weird one where it's like, wow, even people who aren't us like like this one, yeah, baffling. We (laughs) we didn't design it to be that way. We're just like, hey, let's fuck around and make a weird short film. So like, I can when I think of their viewing of it, I can see their faces and they're just like, like nudging each other, (laughs) like, look at that's the roller coaster, that's the greater teen. Like, I would love to have been (laughs) in the meeting where they pitched the greater teen. It's it's it doesn't make sense. 
the <laughs> it's three giant steel blades, kind of like if you took a like a razor and made it giant, and then just drop it. <laughs> yeah, it's like yeah, it's like the, like the underside of like a car crusher or yeah, something. Yeah, with, yeah, yeah. With like three snow plows kind of glued to it, more yeah. or less. It's, <laughs> yeah. it's like I don't know, trisect you. Yeah, quarter like, you, it would quarter you. I the, guess the greater part doesn't make sense. There's no grating. The the teen, the gu- well, I think it's, it's I think it's greater than a guillotine. <sighs> they spelled it wrong. Then are you surprised? Good point. <laughs> <laughs> What didn't work? Chevy Chase. What do you mean? <laughs> uh, yeah, Chevy Chase was the only one that was like, you didn't want to be there, and it shows. Mm-hmm. No, just, uh, like, I've already heard so many things about Chevy Chase from, like, his time on Community yeah. and, you know, just various other things from other movies from over the years. Like, his his reputation as an asshole is just legendary at this point. Yeah. But to know that he's, like, he's on this production with his friends. Yeah. And he's being that much of a chode about things. Like, you were a douchebag on Community. Got it. Uh, don't be, but, like, yeah, okay. Don't, yeah, don't be, but, like, you, like, you're you specifically doing this so you can work with yeah. your friend, who you've worked with on previous films. Yeah. To be that shitty to him, yeah. and to be that shitty to Demi Moore, and to everyone else yeah. there, like, Which, is, like... I forgot to mention that he had an issue with the length of her. I guess I've been calling it a romper. I don't know what it is. It's not quite a dress. It's her 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 outfit. He was her making outfit. sexist yeah. comments about her outfit. Basically, he said it's, it was too short and too revealing. Yeah, it's it's like, fine. It's, she doesn't have a problem with it, and the costumer doesn't have a problem with it. What do you give a shit? Chevy? What do you give a shit? It's not your fucking place, Chevy. But um, yeah, no. I, I, and I even aside from that, just his performance is bad. Yeah, it's like there's no energy behind anything he does. He's just. The difference is, if he was a peach on set and he performed like that, I would feel bad to say he had a bad performance. I would feel bad. Uh, yeah, I would feel bad to say I hated that performance if he was if he was actually like a gem on right. set. But like he's not. He's he, not. Uh, he's he was docu- an asshole. Documented that he wasn't. Uh, so no, it just no. doesn't work. I don't think he should have been. I don't think he should have been in this role. No. Uh, story. Um, I have the Looney Tunes end- ending. The Lo- I mean, pretty... I mean, yeah, we've talked about the Looney Tunes ending. Like, I mean, everyone. I, it, it's no secret that they're that they had a lot of trouble figuring out how to wrap up this film. Yeah, it just. I think he Ackroyd's even said like we needed to end it. We didn't know. Yeah, it was like the, like yeah. it's not a good ending, but it's the best we can come up with at the time. Yes. Is what is the the sentiment that people seem to have about it? It yeah, the ending doesn't work. I think the. The connective tissue between set pieces, I for I, what do you mean by that? Um, a lot of what's supposed to be moving us through this is kind of the the, the supposed okay. relationship yeah. between uh, between uh, uh, Chevy Chase's character and Demi Moore's character, right? You, and a lot of that just falls entirely flat, is not seeded properly, is not developed mm-hmm. at all, and is utterly interrupted by Demi Moore getting side quested yeah. out into Bobo and little devil land. Like it's <laughs> yeah. Which like is fun. It's yeah. fine. She actually kind of shines in those moments. Yeah, a little it's bit, weird. I think. Like she, like it, like her she per- gets away from Chevy long enough that we get to see her act. <laughs> yeah, for yeah. real. Her acting is at least not centered around Chevy. Right. At those, uh, you know, finally. And uh, while like, I don't think her performance is necessarily the best in this movie. I don't think she was bad. And I think in those moments, she really did a pretty good job. Yeah. She even I, leaned into the weirdness of it, which like good honor. Kind of like Forrest Whitaker, where <laughs> <laughs> he will be our our mascot. Oh yeah! Of, oh my god! Will... <laughs> yeah, I haven't watched much of Demi Moore. Pans of Carbango for Forrest Whitaker. He's such a delight. Like I hadn't watched much of Forrest Whitaker, so I, like it made me want to watch more of him. Same thing with Demi Moore. I haven't watched much. Yeah, of her. this did make me want like, to watch more Demi Moore stuff. Her. Yeah, I mean, I've seen Ghost, but like, oh sure, yeah. For me, aside from the last five minutes. The hardest part of this movie to watch was the first fifteen. Absolutely, yeah. The yeah, like you said, once they get to Vulcanvania, the pacing yeah. picks up so so much, yeah. and it's because the beginning, the setup is so slow. Like they take so much time trying to establish what's happening with Demi Moore's like business partner slash yeah. love interest in Atlantic City, yeah. and tr- and trying to figure out how how Chevy Chase's character is able to like yeah. swoop in and give her a ride. And then like how the Brazilian heirs are able to kind of like insert themselves into everything. The contrivances of getting these four together into Vulcan Vulcanvania do not work for me. It's too, it's so clumsy. It's so, 
it's plotting. The pace is yeah. plotting in those moments. It's not until they get to Volcanvania that things really start to pick up. It's like once you see all those ramshackle high noon set huts yeah. and or, 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 uh, or shacks and like all yeah. the people, all the rednecks and and uh, and rejects on the. We, uh, on we didn't the, mention. That, we didn't did mention we? that. I don't think. No. The set was the set, uh, at least the initial part of Volcanvania was where you see where, where Chevy Chase is like berating and belittling the townsfolk before they get into the high speed chase. Yeah. That was the high noon set. Yeah. The Which, only thing that I think they did to differentiate it was they didn't light certain buildings yeah. and they painted a yellow line down the middle of the road. I think that's, I'm pretty sure that's it. Dennis doesn't seem like a cop. Dennis doesn't seem like a cop. It doesn't seem like he wants to be a cop. No, which I think, I think it makes his desertion at the end more believable. Yeah. Oh yeah. But it kind of makes it way too easy to get there though. Like there's not a whole, yeah. there's not really much of a journey well, there the, for him. The only part of it that I'm like, that feels like a weird cop moment or weird moment for his character is when he's arresting Baldwin and Baldwin pulls a gun on him mm. and he pulls, I think he pulls a fucking Uzi. He pulls like a machine gun or something yeah. on him. Yeah. He immediately, he immediately escalates with more, with bigger fire. He, he becomes like bad cop. But yeah, only which for has that not been one his, second. Yeah, yeah, it's not his character anywhere else in the film. It's, if Purdue I, had done that, it makes I would sense. believe that yeah. entirely. Yeah, themes and or production. I said that the and this is more thinking with the initial release date being Halloween. Yeah, is like that Halloween vibe could use a little boost. It could a little, little Halloween vibe. I mean, given that it ended up coming up Valentine's Day instead, right, there's yeah. no, it's not nearly enough Valentine's Day. Uh, <laughs> need more chocolate. Uh, need less Chevy. <laughs> Let, let's just replace Chevy Chase with a, a chocolate giant bunny. chocolate bunny. Wait, this Easter shit huh. with a giant <laughs> gummy bear. I rub you <laughs> coated in chocolate. Ew, <laughs> <laughs> they exist. I think gummy chocolate turn. covered mm. gummy bears. I think that's a thing. I don't know. I'll take it over Chevy. I'll, <laughs> uh, same as. Much as I enjoyed them, what were the point of Fausto and Ronaldo? Ronaldo? I, I, I mean, again, I think that like they cre- they were trying to create too easy an out for uh, for Dennis and them them getting away and trying to get back to Brazil yeah. and kind of opening a door for him to get away to paradise, uh, so to speak. I think it's a mixture of like he had this idea for these two characters he thought was funny. It's kind of like an SNL sketch that they were like. Look, it's a little funny bit yeah. with these, and then they're like they get to the meat of the story, and they don't need them anymore. And there is an argument that for like this movie feeling like a series of skits because I could see that for parts. Like it's not like a loose amalgamation of like unrelated yeah. scenes by any stretch of the imagination, but you can definitely see that like. Uh, there were certain beats that Aykroyd had in mind that yeah. he kind of hit a little bit harder than some of the connective tissue. And like mm-hmm. it comes off uh, – some of those do come across more as like uh, like Second City or SNL style yeah. skits. I don't know about you, but like I have I associated him as a movie actor first and then I learned about him being in – SNL and second right, scene. and that's yeah. I mean, that's that's the background for a lot of the actors in this. Like, yeah. like, uh, like Chevy Chase, John Candy, Dan Aykroyd all came up doing improv. Uh, mm-hmm. Brian Doyle Murphy came up doing all that, all that stuff. And that was a big problem with Chevy Chase's role. In this is he leaned way too hard into improvisation. He kept insisting yeah, his improv that, yeah. was going to be better than the script, and it fucking sucked. With all that in mind, do you think it earned its accolades? Who? Um... I think I think it's fair to say it probably did earn its accolades. Uh, it's, it's, worst picture might be a little bit much in terms of the stinkers, but oh, sure. Um, uh, but but you know, but it didn't win the Razzie for that. It you know it it, it uh, yeah. lost to Hudson Hawk. Which now I'm curious about Hudson Hawk. Yeah, we'll, we'll, <laughs> Just, get we'll get to we'll it. We'll get to it. <laughs> it. <laughs> I would say it it earned its accolades, but it did not earn its infamy. Yes, I think that is fair to say. Unlike Bonfire of the Vanities, we've watched a couple of bad movies now. That I'm like, yeah. We're yeah. we're at like fifty fifty right now for like movies yeah. that I think deserve the infamy. Whereas I f- expected to go into this and hate the like hour and a half, two hours. Well, I didn't. Well, I just I, fucking didn't. I in like whenever I do watch a, a a movie for the second time, prepare to write the script. It's a slog. Even Wild Wild West, which I I do enjoy. I was like, I don't really want to watch this again. But I, well, I watched it a second time at work, and I'm like, it's still pretty funny. It's still pretty good. Wonderful. Well, we're going to take this amazing movie, 
and make it even better. Or make it even better. In Act Three, we're gonna take a little break here, little and break. Uh, we'll be back. We'll be back to show you that hotness. Welcome back to Drazzled. We're about to take nothing but trouble and make it even better. There's only going up because we refuse to go down. We respect it too much. <laughs> yeah, I only really have a couple suggestions aside from the story. When we do a fix, we have a couple of rules we follow. The first is that we can only recast two parts. We can't change the story significantly from what it was. We cannot give the production anything that the production itself would not have had at the time. So no new technology, no Correct. upgraded cameras beyond, you know, beyond those years. Yeah. Uh, uh, so it would be 1991. No casting or, or producers or directors who would be active now. Right. Like Wes Anderson can't make this as much as I really would love for him to make it. <laughs> that would be a whole di- – oh, my God. The colors alone the would cast pop. would fucking be amazing. He should work with Dan Aykroyd. I'm honestly surprised he hasn't. Wes, work with Dan. Work with Dan. Good talk. Uh, with that in mind, um, I'd like to suggest to you two changes to the cast. Uh, the first being, instead of Chevy Chase, we go with Steve Martin. Ooh. Yeah. See, now part of me had been th- had been wondering, like, what if they had gone with who the supposed second choice for the role was, which was who apparently was Rick Moranis. Holy but Steve, shit. but I like Steve Martin a lot better. I I do like Rick Moranis. I mean, it would be an entirely different film. Oh, absolutely. It would also be incredibly awkward to see Demi Moore kiss Rick Moranis. It really I mean, would. I It'd be it a different be- kind of awkward, though. I mean, you have that kiss between him and Sigourney Weaver in the first Ghostbusters. That's true. And it's supposed to be weird and gross, and it is. Um, I mean, they're both possessed by dogs. Both so possessed by dogs. That, just, <laughs> tough break. That's uh, rough, buddy. That's rough, buddy. <laughs> the, so I, I I watched Planes, Trains, and Automobiles for the first time. Oh, nice. Uh, okay. It was great. I loved it. Excellent um, movie. I think for John Candy, I, I prefer Uncle Buck as far as performances go. Sure. But you know, it, was, it was a pretty solid film. Steve Martin has this ability to take a character that's written like an asshole and make him charming. Yes, because he himself is charming. Yes. And that is why I think you can still have the character of Chris Thorne be an asshole, and he should be an asshole. Yeah. But with Steve Martin playing him, you can still enjoy his performance. You're not constantly wishing him for to just be ground into hot dog. Yes. <laughs> also, it'd be pretty hot to see him get any more. Both pretty good looking. Yeah, you're not wrong. Yeah. And the second one, I'm a little. I don't know that it's entirely necessary, but I wanted to. I wanted to play with it a little bit. Replacing Taylor Negan with uh, as Fausto uh, with Arsenio Hall. Ooh, yeah, interesting. And so, are you eliminating the sister character altogether? No. Or? What I want to do is basically give all of Fausto uh, that version, all of Fausto's lines to her. So, just basically combining those two parts because they're not they're not terribly different as far as characters go. Oh, so you're just you're just kind of melding them into a single character yeah. then. Okay, yeah. I got gotcha, you. I got gotcha. you. Um, Interesting. Like the only difference between the original version of Fausto and Ronaldo is one of them wants John Candy sexually and the other one doesn't explicitly want John Candy sexually. But he might. But he might. I mean, it's John Candy. It is John Candy. Hey. So Arsenio Hall. Now, my one worry there is that yeah. would this be too much of a retread of his character from coming to America? I wanted to go with a character that like an like an A-list actor that you could have them play the secondary character and have them not overtake. Like if I if I'd gone like with Eddie Murphy, like I don't know, I would not get a show. I don't don't think Eddie Murphy would be a good choice in that in that department. Yeah, Yeah. Arsenio, though, I mean, he's shown that he can do that. Yeah. So uh, it it seems like every time we do one of these stories, there's like a character that kind of gets not as well developed. Right. Sure. Part of that is that we have like a week and some change to make our fixes. Sure. When I when I write my own stuff, I write the main characters first, like male, female, protagonist, uh, antagonist. And then you have like the secondary characters, like the character characters, the characters that like as an actor, I like to play them. But they don't really get developed until like a third or fourth draft, right? 
Mm-hmm. I'll, I'll, I'll seed some ideas in there and you'll see that. But Arsenio, uh, I, I kept the name Fausto just for clarity's sake. I would, uh, I would change it. Forward. So again, you're still thinking this is like first draft of this pass. Yeah, yeah. So like he his character would, would be developed further. <laughs> kind of like with um Katara in Airbender. Like we sure. did we did what we could, but given the amount of time, it, you know. so yeah, I'd like to to play with some ideas there. And um there's a very fine line that I try to balance with this where I keep with the story that we have and try to keep with the comedy of the time without being an asshole. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's amazing how that's an option. And well, it seems like a lot of people in the 90s and 80s and 70s and 60s and 50s and 40s and 30s didn't think about that. Listen, Nosferatu was very ahead of its time. Nosferatu was woke. That's yeah, fair. Very woke. Yeah. <laughs> woke Veratu. <Ferratu. laughs> All right. That's an idea for another time. We'll, we'll play with that. We'll workshop it. Um, I want to suck your blood, but only if you're into it. <laughs> yes. So, yeah, you, you please, uh, if you're like, that's not, we shouldn't do that, please uh, don't hesitate to be like, that's don't, not going to play well. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Especially when we get to the character of Aldana. I, was, I had a feeling you were going to yeah, say yeah, Aldana, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, with that in mind, there's a couple of tiny character tweaks I want to make before we jump into the story itself. The first is that Fausto is now Chris's business partner. Okay, so he has yeah. a more a more definable relationship going in, yes. going into this. He uh, so um, Ronalda, I made her name feminine because I keep doing it on, on accident. I'm sorry. It, it's uh, she's his cousin. Oh, okay. And Diane Demi's character. Yes, she is spoiler a maid in this. Interesting. Yeah, and I'll get to that in a minute. And I renamed Aldana Grunda. Grunda. <laughs> For two reasons. One, I think Aldana is kind of a pretty name. Aldana is a pretty name. And I wanted to make Grunda. Out of curiosity, have you seen Gravity Falls? No. A, do that. Okay. Uh, B, there's a character named Grenda. Okay. <laughs> She's fun. Okay. <laughs> She's a very good character. Great, great minds. <laughs> She's also like a 13-year-old. It's fine. Oh, okay. We'll, we'll get to Grunda. Um, I wanted to make like a nondescript congealed blob of nothing. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, we'll get to it. We'll get to it. Is that it. I think that's it. I think I keep most of the other characters as they are. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> Fade in on the suburbs at night. We focus on a home decorated in cobwebs and speckled with jack-o'-lanterns. Below, the sidewalks are packed with children dressed as ghosts and witches and cowboys. A title card fades in. October 31st, 1952. Beneath it, Ooh. Halloween. Getting that Halloween in there. Yeah. I like that. We push into the second floor window. Inside, we hear a child pout. Mom, I don't feel good. We slip inside the room to see a child of five in bed, his mother sitting on the foot of the bed. He's scared, frightened by the whole holiday. His mother assures him that it's fake. It's all fake, just masks. Lip protruding, he asks if that's true. She assures him that it is and says that if he really doesn't want to trick or treat, would he at least say hello to his cousins? They've traveled all the way from Vulcanvania to visit. Okay. Holding his mother's hand, the little boy descends the stairs. Though at first apprehensive, he spots his cousin, a boy of about the same age, dressed as a police officer. He breathes a sigh of relief. The friendly child cop declares that he wanted to go dress as Vincent Van Gogh for Halloween, but his father said art is for uh, sissies. He lifts an evidence bag containing a bloodied rubber ear. But mom let me keep the ear as evidence. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, I like that. He's strange, but the frightened boy likes him. Then his mother tells him to meet his other cousin, Grunda. The boy turns to see what looks like the love child of Shrek in a tuna noodle casserole, birthed and made to live in that spot under your toilet that never gets cleaned. Initially, I had it Shrek and Pizza the Hut, but I thought that was too specific. Too specific a character? Yeah. You, know, do, you, you just wanted one specific character to, uh, to pull from there? Yeah. Um, Make me think about Shrek it's, with a it's tuna like, noodle casserole. And... It's like American Pie with the tuna noodle casserole. <laughs> Oddly enough, still still featuring Eugene Levy as the dad. Yeah, yes, I, he's great. He's so good. I love um, him. I hate myself. <laughs> <laughs> Initially scared, the boy remembers what his mother told him. It's fake, just a mask. Oh, no. Mustering the confidence, he tells his cousin, I like your mask. Grunda smiles and says, This isn't a mask, dummy. This is my face. Grunda laughs. The rest of the boy's family joins in. The boy oscillates between embarrassment and terror. His body goes rigid. His jaw drops. His hair goes from rusty red to shock white. Because he's Steve Martin. 
He's never. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> uh, I see what you did there. Yeah. <laughs> Cause I've never seen him with any, with not white hair. Uh, my blue heaven. Yeah. Sorry. Movie where he doesn't have white hair. Oh, Go on. What's his hair color? Black, black not gray. I don't know. Really? Yeah. Hmm. It's darker. Go on. Oh. Not important. <laughs> no, no, no. We must address this now. Uh, he had white hair at the time. That's the important thing. Go oh. on. <laughs> Echoing between laughs is a warped version of his mother's words. Fake. It's all fake. Grunda interjects. I'm a pretty princess. <laughs> we fade to the present to Steve Martin curled up in the back of his limo, having a terrible nightmare. He mutters to himself. Fake. It's all fake mask. Mom, don't laugh. No, I'm a pretty princess. <laughs> I do want to hear those words come out of Steve Martin's <laughs> Me mouth <too>. very badly. <laughs> he is shaken from his nightmare by Fausto, his business partner, dressed head to toe as the devil. Chris screams at the sight of the devil, angrily reminding him that he hates Halloween. Unfazed, Fausto tells Chris that he'd better start liking it real quick since his apartment is full of clients enjoying a Halloween party that he threw for cl- client shit. Yeah, sure, yeah. sure. I'm, I'm imagining the... <sighs> The, I can write this whole thing off as a tax yes, expense. Yes, that, but like bigger. <laughs> just, just Rick Moranis wanders past as Louis yeah. Tully in the background. I think I originally had thought like maybe squeezing him in as the cop, <laughs> but I'm like, nah, John Candy's really good. He's really good. Yeah, he would be a fun deputy, but he would be regardless. Arriving at the building, they are greeted by the doorman. Fausto has to remind Chris how he knows him. You see, Chris doesn't associate with little people. And here's where we have to pause because I forgot to mention something. I cannot find where I found it originally, but there was a reviewer who reviewed this movie in 1991 Mm -hmm. who pointed out that this movie feels like every New York yuppies nightmare of going to the countryside, running into some bumpkins who are like inbred people eaters. Sure. And (laughs) well, (laughs) yeah, this is his worst nightmare because he's he's kind of slumming it. Uh, Chris within the film. Yeah. I think it was more of a commentary on like Dan Aykroyd and co that mm. they've, which like I've watched a lot of John Hughes movies lately and man, like even the poorest people in that are pretty well off. Yeah. So that specifically I wanted to address in this script. Okay. Namely like, fuck you yuppie fears. Eat my, eat my grunda. <laughs> Ew. <laughs> I didn't like that. No, no, no I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> So the doorman and Chris have the same conversation that they do in the movie, except Chris wipes his hand hands with a moist towelette following the exchange. Ah, okay. The elevator opens, stuffed with costumed guests. Chris tells him, uh, him being Fausto, uh, he'll catch the next one. Fausto heads up to his own apartment to retrieve cousin Ronaldo, placing cat ears on Chris and calling him a scaredy cat or pussy, depending on what rating we're going for. Fair. Yeah. Chris boards the next elevator only to find a distraught Demi Moore in maid attire. After a moment of silence, Diane breaks down in tears. Feeling awkward, Chris asks what's wrong. Hysterical, Diane says he's wearing cat ears and her mom has a cat and her mom just called and they found a dark spot on her mom's x-ray. And what if she dies? Who will take care of the cat? Who will change the litter and the food and the unsure how to handle human emotions? Chris invites Diane up to the party uh, for a drink. Diane declines, apologizing for her outburst. But Chris insists she join. Alcohol solves everything. Uh, We get a slightly longer party scene. Fausto helps Chris remember his clients. We see him treat his staff poorly. Uh, We get the impression that he isn't really close with anyone. Yelling into a phone, Ronaldo loudly breaks up with her boyfriend. Fausto attempts and fails damage control. By the end of the night, feeling drunk and a little forlorn, Chris talks to Diane, who assures him he's a good guy. You know. Shouldering the emotional labor. Ah, gotcha. He offers to drive Diane to her mother's place in D.C. Sure, he wants to sleep with her, but maybe he also wants to spend some... Maybe he wants to spend time with a friendly face. She gives him a peck on the cheek, calling him her hero. The next day, we see the same scene of Chris trying to back out until he and the doorman see Diane in a stunning dress. Uh, Ronaldo invites herself along, eager for a rebound in D.C. Okay, so that's a more actionable reason for them for her to be there as yes. opposed to just like, oh, yeah, we're going on this trip with you for reasons. Right, yeah. Oh, where are we going? Trip. Uh, no, she just wants to go get late in D.C. Yeah, like, oh, D.C.? Oh, there's going to be someone eligible there. Right. Let's go. Fausto, knowing both his cousin and his friend, is there to keep them out of trouble. Okay, I like that there are clearer roles and a more understandable relationship between these characters thus far. Yeah, well, like, so this script really does just address Act 1, and then once all the pieces are set up... It's kind of, yeah, it's kind of rolls. Yeah, 
the only stipulation made is that Chris gets to sleep his hangover off while, while somebody else drives. Sometime later, when Chris awakes, he sees that Diane is driving. When he sees a massive sign advertising Vulcanheiser Big Plumps, an image of a cute ginger eating a hot dog on display. Oh, no. Chris flips the fuck out. Diane explains that she always goes through Vulcan... Vulcan why can't I say that? Vulcanvania. Thank you. To get home. He makes her stop the car before he climbs in the driver's seat. Slouched in his seat, he pushes through Vulcanvania, trying not to be noticed, which is impossible given the car he's driving. So does it stand out like a sore thumb? Yeah. Of course. Eager to leave town, Chris fails to make a complete stop at a stop sign. Behind him, a police siren wails. Woo! To everyone's surprise, Chris floors it. Uh, Diane shouts for him to stop. Fausto reminds him that not everybody in the car is white. Renata uh, encourages him to floor it. Chris white knuckles the steering wheel, commenting that he will not get trapped in Falcon Vigna. The gang is apprehended as they are in the movie. Uh, however, Miss Purdue is the pursuing officer, and it's Dennis who's waiting at the end of the road. Okay, so he's already there for the trap. Yeah. Wait, so, so does she have all the gadgets in the car and all the switches and everything, or is it still Dennis? I think we keep the switches. It's it's kind of the it, it's so ridiculous. It eases us into the tone of the weird. Vulcan sure. Vein. Yeah. It is. It is kind of like our first sign of like, oh shit's gonna shift. Yeah. Like, yeah. So Purdue used Simity Sam's from her car. Chris was sweating profusely. Literally. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I imagine her like trying to like get her uh, gun belt on. She's Where not working. Yeah. Clicking her spurs. Yeah. <laughs> Chris, sweating profusely, tells them he'll pay the ticket and they'll be on their way. Fausto, trying to act casual, donning a white suburban male's voice. Uh, good evening, officer. <laughs> Purdue squins suspiciously in his direction. Chris hands Purdue his ID. She chucks it over his her shoulder towards Dennis. Dennis, uh, seeing the ID recognizes Chris. He encourages Purdue to write them a fine and let it go. She's not about to do that, not with Chris acting like an entitled douchebag. They head to the mansion, passing through the Wonka scrapyard. Rinalda ca- <laughs> comments on the beauty of the metalwork, detecting nodes of Sierra. Fausto, however, picks up more of a Gacy vibe. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, when was Gacy? He died in 94. And okay, I, I, yeah, I, I checked him okay, out. Okay, cool. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, oh, he goes somebody else, but like Gacy's the only one I know uh, John Wayne Gacy, for those of you who don't, who are healthier mentally than I am. Um, <laughs> no, I think I think that's good. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, does or do we do we still get our giant wall of uh, shiny chrome toasters? Oh yeah, good. Oh good. Yeah. Arriving, everyone steps from the car. Fausto places his hands behind his head, lowering himself to the ground. Misunderstanding, Dennis asks if he needs a hand up. Uh, Fausto continues to be perplexed by the lack of police brutality. Uh, oh, okay, so. Stepping out of the story for a second. I, I could really see Arsenio playing that well, actually. <laughs> what I wanted to do was show the two sides of the cop coin. Sure. Yeah. So you have Purdue playing your more typical, if if but cartoonish, corrupt cop, where you have John Candy's Dennis playing the educated, how do I put this? So I, I want him specifically to use de-escalation. Sure. He's the, the, the more mindful yeah. community liaison type. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Which we'll see more of later. Sure. Sure. During the trial, we learned that Diane works as a maid, something Chris was completely unaware of. Oh, he thought it was a Halloween get up. That was a Halloween get up. Ah. We also see his anxieties of being discovered. Due to Chris's ass mouth, shit hits <laughs> the fan. After postponing the hearing for the following day, the judge sneers, telling Chris, Ah, it's good to see you again, grand nephew. The gang lands in a literal vat of squeaky toys. Dennis <laughs> argues in defense of their release. Nope. The judge isn't letting his no good rich snob of a grand nephew off the hook. Neck deep in dog toys. It's like way more dog toys. Uh, I like that. Sh- shouting over the squeaks, the four turn on each other. Fausto blames Ronaldo for dragging him around for a booty call. She says he has no lust for life. He retorts. He has a lust for living. Chris cleans his cheek, the place where Diane kissed him, with a moist towelette. Just like vigorously like wiping his cheek. Oh, so he's gone right back to class's dick hole right away. Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, I made, touched him, and lied to him. When asked how she lied, he points out her disguises. A maid's costume and a sexy romper. <laughs> Hurt, Diane tells him that that's her work uniform 
and the romper was like a blue light special Kmart. Hell yeah. Yeah. There you go. I don't think that's time appropriate. No, there were absolutely blue light specials at Kmart at that point. Well, actually, really? well, there are Kmarts. At maybe, yeah, maybe, I know there are Kmarts. Light, I don't know if they have blue light specials. Mm, blue light special might have been a later thing. So yeah. th- thing to look up for a second draft. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And they wouldn't be in this situation if he hadn't been a dick and tried to escape. And what's yeah. the shit about him being a family with these people? Arguments devolve amidst the squeaks. Uh, <laughs> just, just all, all the, this high tension and anger yeah, and just yeah. – and just <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So like it, eventually you can't even hear them over the squeaks. Yeah. We encounter the Baldwins. However, when Baldwin pulls a gun on Officer Dennis, he successfully uses de-escalation techniques. Aha. Uh-huh. Misunderstanding. Purdue sneaky tases Baldwin. Sure. Okay. Uh, this this feels more in line with both of those characters. Yeah. Like ah, good good thinking, cousin, or whatever. Sure. Because she just doesn't she doesn't get it. Things end up the same. Roller coaster. Baldwin sausage. <laughs> Over dinner, the judge elaborates on his hatred for bankers, blaming them for sucking the money out of the land and the land out of the land. I'm thinking something more like fracky. If fracky. Uh, I don't think uh, hydraulic fracture was a, th- a practice at the time. Oh, though, it was so... something that we've been blessed with in our. Life yeah, time. that's yeah, that's that's a that's a 21st century <laughs> bit of bullshit right there, my friend. Ah. Uh, at least I'm pretty sure. I think it, you're um, right. That's also it's also specific to natural gas. So um, it uh, yeah. So that we will just want to stick with coal mining. Great. He doesn't like bankers. Doesn't like bankers. Yeah. Uh, that, that's the upshot, folks. <laughs> then he he goes on to talk about Vulcanizer big plumps, how they saved them and made them a fortune. Then he says the only thing worse than a banker is a rich banker nephew who acts too good for his kin. As things become awkward, Grunda, Miss <sighs> Little Plump herself, arrives. Did, did, was that clear that she was supposed to be the girl on the billboard? Actually, I did not pick up on that. I'm sure that's, that's the kind of thing I think is it would play visually, better visually. Right, right. Yeah, I um, missed that in the description. It would be like, so like Wendy from Wendy's is supposed to be Dave Thomas's niece or something like that. Or, is, that or is, is that is that actually true? I'm going to pretend that it is. I think it is actually. All right. Though. But like if in reality, Wendy from Wendy's was a grotesque um, toilet moss. What does Ted Cruz have to do with this? <laughs> <laughs> Stop wearing that, Ted. Uh, <laughs> Purdue, sitting across from Fausto, stares, but can't put a finger on what's not right. Appealing to their mutual class, Chris tells the judge that these are just his employees. He hardly knows these degenerates. Certainly, a deal can be made between a banker and a judge. Confused, the judge asks, uh, ain't these your friends? Hurt, both Diane and Fausto say that they don't know this man. With Ronaldo retorting, bitch, I don't know you. I teach advanced computer engineering at Cornell. Yeah, I want to give her a little bit of spice. Yeah. Yeah. It's then that Purdue puts on her, like, Coke bottle thick eyeglasses and realizes her mistake. Fausto is black and Ronaldo is Latina. Yes. Something everyone else was aware of. But she's just picking up on and it she's now. she's <laughs> just picking up on it now. <laughs> Fucking great. <laughs> she draws her Uzi, shouting something about... Uh, War on drugs. Uh, <laughs> Fausto and Ronaldo crash through the window, escaping into the junkyards. Purdue fires, but misses. Pissed, she whispers intensely, release the babies. Oh, no. <laughs> Fausto and Ronaldo <sighs> turn a corner only to see two adult-sized baby push their kennel door open. The chase begins. Push their two adult sized babies push their kennel door open is a hell of a sentence. <laughs> and out uh, so out come Bobo and Little Devil. Correct. Okay. Inside, Chris and Diane are caught by Grunda and taken to the bedroom. The judge says he'll see him in the morning for sentencing. Sure, sure. Outside we see Fausto and Renata make it across the moat only to be caught by Dennis. Over dramatic as always, Renata asks if she may gaze upon the beauty of the metal moat sculptures one last time. Dennis, taken aback, asks if she really likes it, likes them, the sculptures. She does. Oh, I think I see is, where this is going. Yeah, she does, and is impressed to find out that he made them. Yes. <laughs> Hell yes. There we go. Reason for a relationship. We're yes. succeeding this here. Fausto offers to hook Dennis up with an art dealer he knows in New York City. Uh-huh. White, white trash is very in vogue this season. <laughs> <laughs> Again, a line I think Arsenio Hall would deliver with a plum. <laughs> you know, I haven't really seen him outside of coming to America. I know, I know he had his, I like, have. talk show, but I, I, I know I have seen him in other things, but that is a, that's just like the peak example yeah. of his of his I mean, so good. career. Yeah. Before Dennis can respond, Purdue comes over the hill, Bobo and Little Devil running ahead on on chains, barking like dogs. Oh, <laughs> God, that's fucked. It's really, yep. <laughs> Purdue is bummed, saying Dennis has all the luck. When asked by uh, Fausto and Ronaldo why that is, she informs them that it is house rules that whoever catches a runaway 
gets to be the executioner. You see, jailbreak is punishable by death. That, too, is a house rule. Oh. One of my beefs with the original script was that they they just throw that house rule line out there, which, like, I, I thought was funny. Yeah. But also, like, you could have done more than They absolutely could have, yeah. In the bedroom, Diane and Chris have it out. She asks if he'd like her to clean the room before he sleeps. <laughs> He didn't even know that she was a maid. She screams, not a maid, your maid. We then see a mini montage of Diane mating about Chris's apartment. He completely oblivious to her existence. Huh. Yeah. Well, shit. Yeah. You've heard of that study where, like, rich people walk past lower-income folk and not even, literally not even even register them. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, Diane attacks Chris, asking him how he can be so elitist with the Vulcanizers for family. She says that all rich people are the same, creepy, mutant snobs. The argument culminates into both declaring that they are more than what they were born into. He, his family of cannibals, and she, her wealth bracket. While I was working on this, I was also reading Off Season by Jack Ketchum, which is based on the the same legend that The Hills Have Eyes is based on. Oh! So, inbred cannibal people. It was a weird kind of vivisection, (laughs) cross-section of... um, Weird bit of synergy. The room, calling. Chris tells her to take the bed. She declines. She's used to sleeping on the couch. Chris insists. Diane says there's more than enough room on the bed for both of them. So long as he doesn't try anything. Not that he would, because she's a lowly maid, and he would, like, need a bunch of moist naps. He tells her that wiping wiping his face with a moist nap was his biggest regret of the day. On top of, like, running. After a beat. She kisses him on the cheek, replacing the kiss that was by Bill. Uh-huh. Yeah. Gotcha. Uh, Steve Martin gives a charming Steve Martin smile and uh, whispers, I'll never wash this cheek again. The two fall asleep. Okay. That is... Um, less creepy? Way, it's leagues and leagues less creepy than what happens with the Chevy Chase version. Bravo. So, like, that, those are the big, big changes. From here, I do, like, little tweaks. Yeah, I was going to say, for, it, it feels like from here we're getting uh, a little bit more into where shit's just fun and big and yeah, exciting. Yeah, So, yeah. Like, now that, that the characters are set up and we understand their relationships to each other, like, they can just do their thing. Mm-hmm. So, a couple, couple small changes, though. Sure. Jealous, Grunda is the one who triggers the bed spin, not Dennis. Ah, okay. Under the judge's penis nose, instead of a weird gaping mush... It's just a much smaller penis nose. He's penis heavy. It's like he's got self conscious about his penis nose. He's 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 replaced the tiny penis nose with a bigger penis nose. It's, I, listen, if they can have a fully functioning <laughs> roller coaster, I can have a tiny penis nose. Please don't isolate that clip. I'm putting that everywhere. Are you <laughs> kidding me? I'm, <laughs> I'm making that my ringtone for you. <laughs> <laughs> I can have a tiny penis nose. <laughs> Jack's calling. I can have a tiny penis nose. What the uh, hell? I really shouldn't have this on at work. <laughs> no. Uh, when the d- digital underground is brought before the judge, Chopmaster J reminds Humpty Hump that whether it's an audience of one or one million, they always give their best. Get the props. Because I, I, <laughs> as much as I love that scene, the one thing in the scene that was like, what the fuck, mm-hmm. is that they had props. Yeah, because it, it feels like it's too of a, much of a like unrecognized or unacknowledged heightened reality moment. And yes. like, yeah, to actually make that more diegetically sound, I think is, yeah. <laughs> and also it's, it's, it's just done. a good, uh, good way to, to live as a performer. Oh yeah. And I feel like digital underground would, would understand that. Um, Shock G would approve when Grunda and Chris are, are wed. She wears the same ratty princess costume that she did at the beginning of the film. <laughs> when, Appropriate. Yeah. When Grunda lifts Diane over the vent, uh, her, purse falls in and the earth shakes so we're seeing like if something falls down ah, a hole like, okay it, it, so we're yeah. so we're seeding the the uh the centralia mind disaster like coming to fruition yes. a bit more yeah. now okay it's so less it, of a like, it's less of a deus ex mock and a last second thing correct when chris makes his escape diane runs into grunda house rules dictate that she must marry grunda to ju- to this the judge says ah the boys could benefit from having a mother around oddly progressive <laughs> yes if anything can be said about the judge, I'll be progressive. <laughs> Big fan of Digital Underground. And the gay marriage. And the gay marriage. <laughs> Chris doesn't go back for Diana. He goes back for everyone. The judge intends to have a dual marriage execution, Vulcanvania wedding style. Oh. Yeah. So it's Fausto and Ronaldo under the, the greater team with Diane uh, ready to 
wed Grenda. Wait, when did they get caught again? When they swam across the moat, they had the moat with Dennis. Then Purdue drives up. Well, doesn't drive. She has Bobo and Little Devil on chains. Oh, on the chains. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah no, I forgot. Okay, I forgot about that awful detail. Yeah, <laughs> your brain was just trying to like. I was trying that. to repress it already. Yeah. Just uh, Chris doesn't Rambo his way back, but climbs mm. through the waist chute of Vulcanizer Big Plumps. Oh, he's got to, he's got to get real down and dirty. Yeah. Oh no. Post uh, shoot, he he tries to like in vain like wipe. The meat jumps uh, off with his moisty naps. He runs out. He's going <laughs> to run like, out of moist naps at this point. Poor moist naps. <laughs> One's not enough. Yeah. I keep folding it and folding it. <laughs> oh, God. This is entirely off topic, but we can cut it. So when I was a youth. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I was probably like 10 or so. Um, we visited my, my grandfather, the same one that likes Chevy Chase. Sure, sure, sure. In North Carolina. And I, I pooed. Like you do. Like you do, like most humans do. And I clogged his toilet. And I was like, well, that's no good. Where's your plunger? And he's like, I don't have a plunger. Never need a plunger. <sighs> that's a lie. Yeah. You see, he was in the Navy. He's like, in the Navy, we got one ply of toilet paper. And we just folded and folded and folded. Anyway, he used his hand as a plunger. So, Ew. so that's, <laughs> that's where I was afraid that was going. Yeah, like, I mean, where else could it go? Oh, uh, God. At least like. Use a butter knife or something and then throw that out forever. Like, it's, well, it's stuck. It's like stuck in the toilet. Uh, anyway, if you're in the Navy, please let us know. Did you get more than one? Or you just how badly how folded bad, and folded? Uh, <laughs> smaller and smaller. <laughs> finer and finer. Uh, oh my God. He was like, Your butthole's only this big. And I went, Yeah. He was a peach. Thanks, Gramps. I'm like, I'm looking at a much bigger butthole. <laughs> Things I did not say as a youth. <laughs> You know that moment where you, you think back on on a conversation or an argument, and you have the perfect yeah. comeback, like yeah. hours or days or years later. Yeah, like yeah, that's. I mean, I can't imagine how that would have went as like a ten year old. Oh, saying poorly, that. It was so bad, poorly. Uh, but ah, would have been great. Worth it. <laughs> Look great, man. Memoirs. Anyway, um, uh, the discussion with the police is the same, but more confusing because it's all four of them trying to like talk over. Each oh other. my god. Okay, yeah. yeah. So they're just like a like, mile a minute, just retelling <laughs> everything, shouting yeah. over yeah. each other the whole time. Yeah. Um, it's kind of, kind of like this. Is that Ghostbusters one? Uh, is Ghostbusters talk to one? <laughs> the <Yeah>. mayor. <sighs> like the film, they are recaptured by the judge. However, Chris barters with the judge, offering to marry Grunda in exchange for his friend's freedom. The judge agrees, finding them not guilty for running the stop sign, even though it was just Chris. But whatever. Yeah. But immediately goes back on his on his word because they are guilty of a jailbreak. Yeah. Which is again. Punishable, punishable by, death. by death house rules as chris and grunda are ready uh, are reading their vowels the other three have a noose placed around their neck chris and gang share a moment of connection both apologizing and being thankful for each other's friendship however officer purdue holds up the wedding slash execution saying that dennis is the one who's supposed to pull the lever uh, to the to pl- complete the execution because those, those are house rules and the judge barks for her to like get on with it when chris begrudgingly says i do the lever is pulled and all three start their descent to the death at the end of the rope that's when three rapid gun blasts are heard all three ropes snap and everyone falls to the ground mostly unharmed we then see chris look to the ridge where he he sees dennis rifle in hand adorned in a painter's smock and beret his left ear cut off (laughs) oh god (laughs) this might be Stepping a little too far, but I don't care. Um, <laughs> but you didn't, you didn't have to go that hard. <laughs> uh, Diane tells Bobo and Little Devil that Miss Purdue was very mean to her. They instantly understand taking Purdue and chucking her down the vent. This starts a massive earthquake. Oh, no. And then I, I say, more shit in hole? Dennis Masterpiece? I didn't know if it, we needed to like, throw more stuff in it to like escalate the earthquake. I don't know. Or throwing if, a, if throw, one Purdue was enough. Throwing a human is probably... <laughs> Probably yeah, enough. She's, she's a tiny human. The gang escapes, as do Bobo and Little Devil. Even Grunda is seen driving away, uh, disguised behind a pair of sunglasses and a scarf around her head, kind of like, kind of like nineteen fifties. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm imagining. Um, oh shit, I'm drawing a blank on. I know the image yeah. you're talking about, but yeah. So like, we see Grunda disguised with a scarf around her head, sunglasses, driving away in like a pink Cadillac. That oh, absolutely. Comes yeah. from nowhere. Over her shoulder, she shouts, I'm going to Hollywood, baby. 
Only the judge is seen to meet his demise. The giant water tower that holds the big plump meat uh, crashing down on him. Like Ghostbusters, but with meat. But with meat. Yeah. Uh, meat busters. Meat. <laughs> God. You're welcome. Mm, that's <laughs> definitely like a highway roadside. <laughs> Come over meat busters and get you two, two foot long meat dog. For the price of two. For the price of two. <laughs> uh, uh, specifically, I, I know you're talking. I know you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, but, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, when when Mr. Staypuff explodes and um, Walter Peck is doused in marshmallow. Marshmallow. Yeah. Uh-huh. We got the black title card. November twenty sixth, Thanksgiving. We cut to Diana's family home. Chris and Diana, clearly a couple, sit at the table. Fausto and Ronaldo and Dennis are there too. In my head, they're like a poly more of a v but okay yeah, yeah. It, was, it would have to be it'd have to be a v right right Just, no no no. we don't want any of that vulcanizer stuff yeah <laughs> <laughs> anyway uh Faust and ronaldo and dennis are there too uh mixed among diana's siblings and family dennis has since had his ear stitched back on realizing that was a really bad mistake <laughs> <laughs> yeah i really didn't need to do that i got caught up in the moment guys <laughs> But he has continued with his art uh, with the encouragement of girlfriend Ronaldo. Nice. Uh, he even has his first exhibit, Made Ooh. Possible with Faust's Help, titled White Trash. Trash or treasure? Hmm. We find out that the dark shadow in Diana's uh, mother's x-ray, which is why we went on this thing in the first place. Right, right, right. Is actually like $2.16 and change that she like swallowed as a kid. <laughs> What? It's just, it's just a bunch of like nickels and dimes that have just like gotten lodged in her colon. <laughs> I... No, <laughs> wait. <laughs> How do they not catch that? <laughs> They're bad doctors. Apparently, <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> so there's dark shadows. But they were they were not sober either. There's dark <laughs> shadows fucking your extra. Well, the years worth of malpractice suits that <laughs> she that she got to she got to got to file at that yeah. point. She, uh, she's better off than she ever was. <laughs> There's a ring at the door. Diana's mom answers. It's Bobo and Little Devil, dressed in Sunday's best. Oh, with what appears to be uh, animal crackers and Jello. The, it's they made it. They made like a dish to bring along. Yeah, but no, they, of course. Yeah, so it's it's like ice animal crackers and literally Jello. Yes. Yeah. But they're, they're, cr- they're pushed in. The animal crackers. Are oh, pushed so in it's like an animal cracker aspect. I don't know what that is, but yes. I'm gonna say yeah. Yes. Okay. Sure. <laughs> um, Diana's mother eagerly invites them in. Beautiful. The film ends with Chris saying that he's thankful for his friends, his new family, clean underwear, and tofu. Because Chris is never touching meat again. <laughs> After climbing through that meat tube, no thank you. Never again. Sitting, he gives Diana a kiss on the cheek. She grabs his face and gives him a real kiss. There we go. This is interrupted by shouting from Bobo and Little Double. They point to the TV in the living room. It's showing the Macy's Day, th- Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. Sure. The camera pushes into the TV where we see Grunda performing upon a float, a holiday ballad that we hear as the credits roll. <laughs> Do we have a title for this holiday ballad? Oh, I, you know what? I actually tried to like find like a period appropriate one, but I, I didn't care enough. <laughs> um, but no, I mean, yeah, I guess we could, it's fiction. And so we could make it up like loves a warm hot dog. Lo- oh, <laughs> Christmas is a a warm hot dog. (laughs) All I want for Christmas is is a warm two hot dogs. (laughs) Is a two foot hot dog? This is not mm. the song I want to hear. Nope. Uh, So that that is that is that that is not that's that is uh, that is nothing but trouble. That is nothing but trouble. I you know what I should probably change the title name too. Yeah, yeah, so that's something we didn't really talk about too much. We mentioned that it it was not originally titled "Nothing But Trouble." Yeah. So originally, originally this movie was titled "Get," like G I T Get, uh, which is also bad. (laughs) Uh, It was then at some at at various points changed to "Road to Ruin." Yes. Then just "Vulcanvania" and "Trick House." I think oh, it's yeah, the yeah. other one, which like Vulcanvania and Trick House, I think are like probably the, the best. Maybe the Vulcanvania Trip House. The Vulcanvania Trick House. Uh, it's they're all pretty bad. They're all pretty <laughs> bad, but yeah, I don't know which one I would want other because nothing but trouble is like a nothing generic title. It doesn't yeah. make any sense. Anyway, yeah. Uh, so that 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 is the script. That was the script. Uh, I I enjoyed that thoroughly. Yeah, I think I think uh, it retains everything that's disturbing about the original and improves everything that sucked. <laughs> 
Well, insofar as the coverage of Chevy Chase, and it makes the, and it makes the character relationships make a lot more fucking. I, I sense. did cheat a little bit. You cheated a little yeah. bit. So we're not supposed to have anything that the production wouldn't have. There is no way that they would have gotten Chevy or uh, Steve Martin. He was so fucking busy that year. Oh God. Um, so Rick Moranis, you're in. Rick Moranis, you're 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 in. You're in doing your best Steve Martin. Uh, what the fuck was Steve Martin doing it's like that? Father year? of the Bride or something like that. Wait, that was the year the original Father of the Bride came out? Maybe. I think oh so. shit. Well, yeah, he but he was he was pretty busy that year. But like What do you mean there was a Father of the Bride part three? <laughs> uh so with the fix, how are we feeling about them scores? Uh, I feel like they would raise. Uh, I feel like um Honestly, I think I think the the tightness of the relationships and uh-huh. like the and the better pacing of that, I think the IMDb score for that might go up to a seven. Of the scripts we've done, mm-hmm. I like this one. Yeah, I, like I feel like, a lot. no, I, I feel like this one. This one has this one's got legs. Yeah, I feel like I feel like this would, uh, uh, considering it already had a lot of fun going into it with the original. Yeah. I, I I think, yeah, I, I think I love this, Steve Martin. Oh my god! Just get just getting Chevy Chase the fuck out of that role. <laughs> That's really is an immediate improvement. Yeah, it. Yeah, I think I think the IMDb score will probably go up to above a seven. I think yeah, if done uh, right, above a seven. Mm-hmm. Uh, Rotten Tomatoes, I dare say, like in the sixties. I think so. Yeah. yeah, the critic score does not change. <laughs> critic score would probably not change. I think no. that I think that the the uh, the issues that a lot of critics had in terms of the 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 style of humor, yeah. the grotesqueries of everything, yeah. the uh, I, th- I think that that's going to stand. That is absolutely yeah. going to stand. But it's. But, uh, it's definitely gonna, if nothing else, I, I guess it's already kind of happening with with the version we have at the moment. It's like slowly becoming a cult classic. Yeah, but it would do it sooner. It would do it sooner. Yeah, yeah. All right, we did. We did it. We did another. We, we did another. Uh... We we did another thing. We've got another another episode down, and ju- just in time for us having our first episode actually listenable. Yeah, um, yeah. I guess uh, we we didn't really cover this, but. Uh, as of you hearing this, I, I will probably be, this will be four or five, so we'll have a couple episodes out. We hope you've enjoyed the ones that are there so far. Uh, yeah, right now Wild Wild West is out. Uh, okay. I think what you said before, new Battlefield Earth as the second Earth second episode will come out on the that'll be the the uh, the twenty first. I agree, September twenty first. That yeah, Battlefield Earth episode will hit various platforms. Mm-hmm. We are uh, the uh, the episode one Wild Wild West is up on Spotify, Google Podcasts. Apple Podcasts, uh, but we're we're getting there, uh, as well as various other podcatchers and whatnot, and uh, yeah, and and uh, the RSS feed is also out there if you want to import it into your uh, podcatcher of choice. And I want stickers. I'd love stickers. I found some that are like shiny. Oh yeah, yeah. Ooh, and like that'd be fun. Our logo would kind it of would look itself, real fucking like, real good. Shiny. Oh my god, those raspberries would pop. <laughs> well, I mean, I guess we can give some out, but like I kind of just want like cover. <laughs> Cover a door with one. Yeah, right. Um, <laughs> God, what door would I cover? Roberto Clemente. <laughs> Roberto Clemente, the, the statue of Roberto Clemente. You would cover it we've, head to toe. We've <laughs> drazzled. And it, the sun will hit it, and it will blind everyone. <laughs> they will they will write sonnets on the, the devastation caused by our sticker, Roberto Clemente. It's just all throughout the day. Like there's there, there's a, there's a risk of uh, of blinding yeah. and boat accidents on yeah. uh, on yeah. the Mon. There's uh, there's a giant uh, pile up along mm. uh, along whatever that road is. This right next to PNC Park. Uh, there's no more stadium there. There's just, no more stadium. It's, it, it's it, like a like a magnifying glass over an ant hill. Yep. Just set Burnt everything ablaze. Uh, you're welcome. <laughs> well, oh, Joe, uh, we we hope that. Yins uh, will, will join us for the next one. Yeah, Thank you please, all for, uh, for, hung, for hunging out. For uh, hunging out. Thank you for hunging out and hanging out. Uh, <laughs> please uh, subscribe on your platform of choice. Keep uh, keep an eye out for any updates. Uh, you know, you know, that will give you the quickest updates about whenever things go live on your on the platform of your choice. Please rate and review us uh, mm-hmm. so we get uh, higher up in rankings and more people can discover us. And uh, please spread the word. Share it with, uh, with your friends, your family, your coworkers. Uh, we're sure to... Sure to razzle dazzle. There yeah. we go. Oh shit. All right. Good night, everybody. Oh my god, I'm so tired.